Well, this is my third presidential election to go through with you as your pastor. And uh, so this is not the first time that I have come before you after an election, even after a contentious election, to try to help us think biblically about how we should respond to what has just happened. Uh, this year, as I have done in the past, I uh, sat down, uh, this time it was on Tuesday morning, and I wrote out five truths that I thought it would be important for us to be reminded of on Sunday, regardless of how the election turned out. Uh, then on Wednesday, uh, we didn't know who had won yet, and I wrote out the entire sermon, not having any idea uh, who was going to win. And honestly, I thought we would be here this morning still not knowing who had won. But now we know, and uh, now we need to move forward, and we need to know how to move forward, and what to think, and what to do, and how God uh, wants us to live um, and act and think in this moment. Now, I reject the hyperbole that says every four years, this is the most important election of our lifetime. However, it does seem like over the last 10 or 12 years that things have gotten more and more contentious. Perhaps you could even argue that each of the last three elections have been more contentious than the one before it. And I don't think it's in doubt that the trend in our culture right now is toward division and distrust and sometimes even disgust toward those who are on the other side of the political spectrum. And uh, that's deeply concerning. Uh, that's deeply troubling. And only time will tell if this election is going to change that trend or if it's going to continue or if it's going to get worse. None of us knows right now. And I don't expect that all of you in this room or uh, watching or listening to this later, I don't expect that all of you feel the same way about how the election turned out. I don't expect that all of you voted the same way in the election but I'm not addressing you as Republicans or Democrats or Libertarians or Independents or any other party affiliation. I'm addressing you as Christians. I'm addressing you as those who believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. I'm addressing you as those who believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, dead, and buried. I'm addressing you as those who believe that this same Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, is now seated at the right hand of the Father, and will one day return to judge the living and the dead. I'm addressing you as those who believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, not the Roman Catholic Church, but the universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. If you confess those truths, you shouldn't have been looking for a savior in this election because you know there's only one and you know who he is. It's Jesus Christ. If you don't confess those truths, we invite you even now to turn to Jesus, to trust in Jesus because he is the only one who can save. He is the only one who can mend what is broken in your life and in this world. He is the only one who can and will set all things right. And if you do confess those truths, I want to remind you this morning of five more truths from Scripture that ought to be bedrocks for you, non-negotiables that not only inform but govern the way that you live. So this morning I am going to give us five truths in response to three questions. First question is, what truths can we hold on to in a time of uncertainty in a country that is suffering a pandemic? The second question is, how should we see ourselves in a country that is painted red and blue? 
And the third question is, what is our role as Christians in a culture that is so deeply divided? Right, so number one, what truths can we hold on to in a time of uncertainty, right? In a country that is suffering a pandemic. The first truth that we can and must hold on to right now is that God is in control. That's a simple truth. It is a fundamental truth, but it is an easy truth to lose sight of. The more things seem outside of our control, the harder it is to remember that God is in control. And yet the more essential it is that we remind ourselves that God is in control. This is a truth that the Bible affirms and encourages us with from Genesis to Revelation. All throughout the Bible, we are told not to fear because God is in control. Psalm 115 verse 3 states unequivocally, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Psalm 103 verse 19 says, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. There is nothing that can thwart God's will, God's purpose, God's plan. He is in control and he gets to do what he wants because he is God. And because he's in control of all and because he reigns over all, the Bible also tells us over and over and over that the kings and rulers of this world, the presidents of this world are in his hand. In Exodus chapter 9, God says to Pharaoh, who was likely the most powerful person on the planet at the time, God says to him in Exodus 9, 15 and 16, by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence and you would have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. Pharaoh was not in control. Pharaoh did not have ultimate power. He was in God's hand and God was using him for his plan. Similarly, later in the Bible, we're told of uh, King Cyrus, the king of the Persians in Ezra chapter one. It says in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the, uh, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. In other words, Cyrus, who came to power, defeated the Babylonians, he said to the people of Israel who were still in exile from when Babylon had conquered them about 70 years before, he said, God's given me this power, God's given me this authority, and God has charged me to build his house in Jerusalem. And so he said, anybody from Judah who wants to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple, go for it. Who would have thought that a foreign king would help Israel return home and rebuild their temple. How did that happen? The Lord stirred the spirit of Cyrus. Both of those examples and more examples that we could turn to in scripture put flesh on a principle that we read in Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. That's true no matter who the king is. That's true no matter who the president is. God is on his throne. His throne rules over every earthly throne, and he is able to move the heart of every ruler on every throne to accomplish his will and his purpose. There's nothing going on down here that can keep God from doing what he decrees up there. He is still in control. 
and his map doesn't look like our maps. Many of us for the last several days have been staring at maps painted red and blue with pink and light blue and gray, and we've been wondering what those maps might mean, what those maps might lead to. But God's map looks very differently, very different than our map. We get an idea of what God's map looks like from Psalm 2. Psalm 2 begins this way. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. In other words, God's map looks like this. All the nations, all the people who are plotting and raging against the Lord and against his anointed, meaning against God and against his Messiah, against Jesus Christ, they're all in the same camp. They may have different affiliations, they may come from different nations, they may speak different languages, they may follow different political parties, but all those who are in rebellion against the Lord, they're in one group. And then there are those who willingly bow their knee before King Jesus, who submit to him, and they're in another group. And that is the one division that actually ultimately matters. Have you bowed the knee to King Jesus, or are you resisting his rule and his reign from heaven? And there are blue people and there are red people in both of those camps. But this is the map that matters most importantly. This is how we must look most fundamentally at the world. There are those who are shaking their fist at Jesus. Red people, blue people, in-between people, shaking their fist at Jesus. And there are red people, blue people, in-between people who are bowing their knee before Jesus. That's what matters most. And regardless of who is in rebellion against God, regardless of what their plans, what their plots what their schemes are against the Lord and against his anointed, God is undeterred, God is unafraid, he laughs at his enemies, he holds them in derision, he has installed his King Jesus on his holy hill, and no one can unseat him or dethrone him. He rules and he reigns. The second truth we need to remember when we're wondering What truths can we hold on to in a time of uncertainty and division? The second truth is that Jesus will build his church. And no one can stop him. One of the unfortunate, even perhaps disturbing things that we have seen over the last several months is there are people who at the least hold the church in light esteem, if not manifest animosity toward the church. And that concerns us, right? That concerns Christians. Uh, That has led to uh, court battles over whether churches can meet in person and and those kinds of things. Um, And there are some legitimate concerns about the direction things are headed in our country in terms of religious liberty. There are some good signs, but there are also some disturbing trends. How are we to think about those things? Well, we must remember what Jesus said to Peter in Matthew 16, when Peter made the good confession. Uh, Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to him, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus will build his church, and not even Satan can stop him. Not even Satan 
can prevail against the church. Now, there may be times of pruning, times of winnowing, times of distress for the church. There may be times where we experience persecution and times where we experience um, more freedom and sort of unhindered blessing. But no matter what time we may, we, we may find ourselves in, Jesus will always be building his church and the existence of his church and the growth of his church will never, ought never to be in doubt because he's promised and he will keep his word. Not only that, but the Bible says that the head of the church, Jesus, is the head over all and over everything. In Ephesians chapter 1, where, uh, Paul talks about how God has raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand. This is what he says. He, he's talking about the power of God at work when God raised Christ from the dead. And, and he says um, that power that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he says, he put all things under his feet, that is, under Jesus' feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. In other words, not only is Jesus the head of the church, but he's the head over everything, over every rule, every authority, every power, worldly or angelic, worldly or demonic. Jesus reigns over every power, and God has given him to the church as head over everything so that we don't have to fear any worldly or spiritual power. We know that no matter what power might be arrayed against us, against the church, we know that Jesus has ultimate authority over that power. Even if he allows resistance, opposition, persecution, he will never allow triumph over his church. He will continue to build his church. Which means we don't need to fear. Even though the earth itself gives way. Alright, second question. How should we see ourselves in a world or in a country that is painted red and blue. How ought we to think of ourselves? Well, there are lots of things we could say on this point, but here's the one thing I want to say this morning. We who are Christians, we are united because our ultimate identity is in Christ. Our ultimate identity is not in who we voted for, it's not in political parties or political identities. It's not in any of the identities that our culture seeks to uh, label us with and make ultimate for us. Instead, our ultimate identity is in Christ. Uh, Paul says this uh, in a couple different places, at least. In, in Philippians, when he wrote the letter to the church at Philippi, Philippi was a Roman colony. Not every city in the Roman Empire was a Roman colony. Roman colonies had certain privileges. And if you had Roman citizenship, that was a really big deal. Not everybody in the Roman Empire had Roman citizenship. But when Paul wrote to this Roman colony, and likely uh, at least some, perhaps many of the people in that Roman city, a Roman colony, had Roman citizenship, or if they didn't, they probably aspired or, or would like to have had Roman citizenship. Here's what Paul says to that church in Philippians 3.20. He says, Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior. So whether or not you're a Roman citizen or just would like to be a Roman citizen, remember your ultimate citizenship is in heaven. Your ultimate identity is that you belong to the kingdom of heaven, you belong to King Jesus, and you are waiting for the day when he will return and, and consummate his kingdom on the earth. Similarly, in Galatians 3, 28, Paul says, 
There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now those categories are probably some of the most divisive categories that existed in Paul's day. The whole world was divided into Jew and Gentile, or Jew and Greek, and neither side liked the other. There were divisions between male and female. There were divisions between slave and free. And there were more divisions besides. We have our own divisions today. Some of those have, if not disappeared, at least become less significant in some ways. But we have our own divisions, right? Our own camps, our own sort of ways of labeling ourselves and trying to elevate ourselves over one group or the other. But Paul says, not that those things don't matter at all or have disappeared entirely. You can't stop being male or female. You can't stop being a Jew or a Greek. But what he says is, when it comes to our standing before God, those identities have no lasting importance. Those identities are not what define us and ought not to be what divides us because what unites us is more significant and that is that we are all in Christ. Whether you're a man or a woman does not affect your standing before God. Whether you are a Jew or a Greek does not affect your standing before God. Uh, your race, your ethnicity, your uh, social background, your, the size of your bank account, all the, none of those things affect your standing before God. There is only one thing necessary for you to have a righteous standing before God, and that is for you to be in Christ by faith. And if that is true of you, that is the most important thing that is true of you, and that is the most important thing that is true of every other believer on the planet, every other brother and sister in Christ. And so whether we voted for different people, supported different people, whether we feel differently about the outcome of the election, none of that rises anywhere near to the importance of the fact that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And what we must not do is let the divisive rhetoric and the divisive um, you know, words and news stories, and all, we must not let all the division that is constantly being pushed in our culture, we must not let that seep into the church. We must not let that divide Christians from one another. We must not keep that, let that keep us from loving one another. We must stand united in Christ. All right, third and final question. What is our role as Christians in a culture that is so deeply divided. What would God have us to do? Again, there are many ways that we can answer that question. There are many things that the Bible has to say that are important things for us to think about in this particular moment. But I just want to draw our attention to two. First one is this. We are called to love our neighbors and even our enemies. This is not new. This is not changed. This has always been true. This remains true. But it is the kind of thing that we have to remind ourselves of again and again and again. Listen to how Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, starting in verse 43. He says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy." But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, 
What more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus says, God loves his enemies. Those who shake their fist at him still get rain and sunshine. Those who break his commandments, those who rail against him, those who dishonor his name and misuse his name, they still get rain and sunshine. Right alongside those who bless his name and worship him and seek to follow his commands. God shows mercy, shows love, even to his enemies. And so if we are his children, and children are meant to imitate their parents, then we likewise must show love not only to our neighbors, not only those who agree with us, not only those who vote like us, not only those who you know, seem to be on the same side as us, we must show love even to those who would hate us, who would revile us, who would perhaps even seek to persecute us. Jesus says, even those you must pray for, even those you must bless, even those you must love. As someone said to me just before election day, he said, um, people are going to be sad and scared no matter which way this thing goes. And he was right. And we need to keep that in mind, right? Whether you feel like you won or lost or whether you feel like we all lost or we all won or however you feel about what happened. Remember that people around you need to see your love. They, they need for us to show the love of Christ to one another and to them. That's what they need. We don't help anything by being just as rancorous as the rest of the country. We don't help anything by being just as divided along political lines as the rest of the country. We help by loving as Jesus loved, even people that it didn't really make sense for people to love, for Jesus to love, according to the, the way people around him would have been thinking. Do the Pharisees look at Jesus' band of disciples and say, yeah, that makes sense? No. But he loved those guys. And they weren't all the same. They were different, even among the twelve. But they loved Jesus, and they trusted Jesus, and Jesus taught them to love one another. And he taught them to love even their enemies. And through them, he turned the world upside down. And through them, he's still turning the world upside down. And we're still called to follow their example, his example. Last thing about how we should respond to a divided culture is this. We're called to pray for our leaders. This is a, this is a non-negotiable. Right? It's true all the time. It's true after every election. It's true in between every election. It doesn't matter who is elected. It doesn't matter... What has happened? We are called to pray for those who are in authority. 1 Timothy chapter 2 says, Paul says to Timothy, he says, First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. We're called to pray for 
whoever is in charge, whoever is governing, whoever is exercising authority, that they would do so in such a way that will not interfere with Christians living godly lives. So we should pray for them to have wisdom. We should pray for them to do what is just and right and good. We should pray that if they seek to do something that would be evil or harmful, that they would be thwarted. And that if they seek to do something that would be good and beneficial and bring blessing, that they would succeed. We should pray that they would be humble. That they would not seek to usurp the authority that belongs only to God. And try to tell people what they can and can't do when it comes to worship. And we should pray that they themselves would worship the one and only true king, and bow before Jesus. Now, nothing I've said this morning ought to be new, shocking, revelatory, right? Because the truth of Scripture has not changed, and God has not changed, and God's promises have not changed, and really our position has not changed, our identity has not changed, our calling has not changed. God remains in control, Jesus is still building his church. We are united in Christ. We are called to love our neighbors, even if they are our enemies. And we must pray for all those in leadership in any position at any time. Those truths are clear. So let's cling to them. They make our path plain. So let's walk in it as we pray together.